Welcome everyone to the Scottish American History Forum. And actually, I want to wish you all a happy Valentine's Day as well, this coming Wednesday. And um, I'm Connie Nestor. I think everyone knows me, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about our History Forum, which is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots formerly the Illinois St. Andrews Society, which was founded in, in 1845 as our oldest 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois. And it was later named Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. It's located in North Riverside, Illinois. And Chicago Scots is actually dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of the Scottish culture, in addition to support of Caledonia Senior Living, Living and Memory Care. Now, additional information, you can all go to www.chicagoscots.org, and we ask you please to remember to give generously to our Caledonia Senior Care Charity it's absolutely something that everyone in the world is proud of. And I will ask Gus to tell us the latest about Caledonia and our upcoming festival and, and uh, uh, here's Ian Baker and everything that's going on to us. Welcome, we're so glad to see you today. It's great to see you, Connie. Uh, it's great to see everyone else. And uh, Jack, I know, is calling in from Africa. You're calling in from Scotland, so we're truly an international affair this morning. Um, I, I bring greetings from everyone who lives and works at Caledonia Senior Living, where we're uh, about to do some major uh, realignment of our mission to create a new model of living for uh, seniors in the North Riverside area. It's very exciting and the wind that's been put in our sails by the biggest philanthropic gift this society has ever received in our 179 year history really gives us some confidence to, to be bold as we kind of realign that mission. Um, the big news I have uh, is that we have now signed a contract uh, to move our Scottish Festival and Highland Games to a new home, and that will be in Wheaton, Illinois, at the DuPage County Fairgrounds. Um, it's been, frankly, the worst kept secret in uh, all of <laughs> the society's history, I think. Everybody knew, but we couldn't make the announcement because the ink was not yet on the contract, but that's now happened, and we will be there for, uh, I hope, for an extended period, uh, building and growing the festival. We have uh, at least a couple of grade one pipe bands who have signed up. And once again, I think we are set to host the biggest bagpiping championship in North America. So we're very excited to bring that to Wheaton. Um, the, the other holdup that we had to negotiate at Wheaton was uh, much more about content. Uh, and when I say content, I mean whiskey. Um, the, Wheaton is famously a dry town or it was yeah. for many years. And though they, they agreed to pour beer and wine at a, a sister festival uh, or another festival that occurred at Wheaton, the village would not allow um, whiskey until the, uh, the manager of the DuPage County Fairgrounds came to our festival and saw how, uh, how well behaved everyone was despite the whiskey and how important it was to the overall cultural experience took it to the village and they agreed that for us, they will change the rule and pour whiskey. So I'm delighted to, to share that news with everyone. Excellent, excellent. I'm so, we're so glad to hear that, Gus, and it's so nice to see you. Well, I'll be seeing you in person on the 25th, I believe, in Chicago. Uh, um, sadly, no, I'll be I'll be in Scotland myself on the twenty fifth, so I'll miss you, Connie. We'll we'll be uh, ships in the night. Places. <laughs> just switching places. Right. I see Jim Sim here, though. Jim Gus was just talking about the uh, the pi pipes and drums band competition at the festival. Would you care to just say a few words about how the planning is coming along? And you know, we typically have the most bands in the country. I think. Well, that's correct, Connie, and 
our entry will just be opening up this coming week. Uh, we just did the template for everything yesterday. So uh, the entry where the bands can start coming in, I can tell you that um, the grade one is the highest level of pipe bands. There's only two grade one pipe bands in the United States. They'll both be at our festival as well as another grade one band from Halif Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, we have another band coming from British Columbia. Um, seven grade two bands will be here at least. So it looks like it's going to be another uh, great weekend. Excellent. And I'll be there. Save room for the history tent. <laughs> <laughs> we will. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I want to move along in the interest of time. Hi, Liz. Hi, Sandy. Um, I just would like to ask that everybody turn your cameras on today. This is by special request of our speaker, David O. Stewart, who really likes to interface with uh, the, the participants when he's speaking. But before we begin today, I just do want to remind you uh, that next month, and is Don McLeod on here? I, get, I, I can't yes. see you. Where are yes. you? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on. Oh, okay. We can't see your face, Don. I can't, I can't get my photo up for some reason. Oh, well, well, we'll forgive you, but we want everybody to tune in next month on March 9th because historian Donald C. McLeod who uh, was former president of the North Carolina St. Andrews Society, and will show his face shortly, I'm sure, uh, will be returning as a speaker. And he's, Don is going to talk on Ulster Scots, Princeton University, where John Witherspoon was president, as you know, uh, and the founding of the University of North Carolina in 1795 and how that came about. And uh, and also tell us about the role of William R. Davy, who was a war hero. So I hope you'll all make time to join uh, on March 9th. It promises to be a fascinating presentation from Dawn. And so now um, we do want to go ahead and move forward with our presentation today. We are so very pleased to have with us David O. Stewart, who some of us have seen in person. Um, Bruce Allardyce and myself, I know, have seen him speak, and Bruce has his book. In the book. Uh, you may want to flash that again, Bruce. But um, David is going to discuss his book, The Burning Land, One Family's Passage Through the Civil War and Into the West. Welcome, David. I think we're ready to turn it over to you, please. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for uh turning out. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the range of your interests. Um, I did a book on uh, the writing of the Constitution, and I believe William Davy was there at the Constitutional Convention, and I could find he, almost nothing. He was. Yeah, well, uh, you, you, you need to uh, let the world know what you know about them, because I could. It was hard. This was twenty years ago, but it was hard to find anything. Hmm. Um, what I want to talk about today uh, is the second of two novels I've done, um, which are inspired by my mother's family's experiences in this country. Um, the first one, you know, well, one strand of my mother's family uh, came early in the seventeen fifties from Germany. Uh, and so they've been here much of the time. Uh, most of my, the rest of my ancestors showed up a lot later. Uh, and they had an unusual name. And if you've done genealogy, you know that it's a lot easier if you've got an unusual name to look for. Uh, I once tried to research William O'Brien in Chicago in the 1880s, and it was pretty impossible. Um, there were dozens. Um, so, the, the first book um, was the emigration story, which is the new land, when they arrive in this country in 1750s on the coast of Maine, uh, and it takes them through the revolution. And then I jump ahead 60 years to what I'm, 80 years really, I'm gonna talk about today, which is uh, the Civil War story, the burning land. And these are inspired by what stories my mother told me, and she was a great storyteller, which I think if you have great storytellers in your family, you probably know means that some of what she said was true. Um, 
but uh, she didn't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Uh, and uh, I've spent some time uh, tracking down what actually happened, and then I ended up deciding to write fiction anyway. I guess I have her bent towards making stuff up. But <clears throat> we, these were, my ancestors were just regular folks. They were not in the newspaper. They were not people uh, uh, of great note. So it's hard to find out too much about uh, ancestors like that. Um, and because it's regular people history, it's very different. You know, I've done a book on, uh, well, we saw the Andrew Johnson impeachment book. I did one on George Washington, one on James Madison. These people left big footprints, and there's a lot of sources. But ordinary people, um, you know, they're just scuffling. And that was the story I was going to tell here in the Civil War. The male protagonist in The Burning Land, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Henry Overstreet, uh, is a ship joiner. And that's a 19th century term for a carpenter who built wooden items on a ship. Um, and he's still living in a town on the coast of Maine. Uh, and the town is still there, actually. It's called Walderboro. Um, and it's a weird town for me. It, it's very small, but they have a lot of people with my mother's last name. And it is an unusual name you, it, you don't run into very often. Um, he uh, falls in love with a woman, Katie Nash, uh, who's actually, that is the name of my great-great-grandmother, and she just wants to teach school. Uh, they end up running a butcher shop and then a laundry. Um, so just ordinary folks, but just like George Washington, a man who aimed high in the world and charted his path accordingly, Henry and Katie have to look at their opportunities. They have to choose um, what their goals are, and then they have to figure out how to reach them. Uh, and of course, their lives are influenced by big historical events. Um, those disrupt the lives of regular people, but sometimes they also open up opportunities. Uh, and in order to write convincing stories about people in the past, um, I need to understand the times that framed them. So that's where the research comes in. <clears throat> uh, of course, in the 1860s, there was this giant war. Uh, it spread across the continent. And it was a war with repercussions that are still with us so many years later. Uh, and we've actually had three wars, I would argue, that have consumed the American world, the Revolutionary world War, the Civil War, and World War II. Um, in each of those three, every American's daily life was different. Um, we've had other important wars and they influenced history, but not, not universally the way those did. And let me give you some numbers about the Civil War to build this out. Uh, there were 35 million people in this country then. Two and a half million served in the Union Army and another million served in the Confederate Army. So that's 10% of the population was in uniform. I think today it's something like 1.4%. Uh, and 20% of the male population was in uniform. Uh, so everybody knew someone who was serving in the war. Most were re related to people who were serving in the war. It was an all-consuming experience. And I like to focus on the home front because that's so important. And one of the sort of myths we cling to or have clung to is that the South was all unified behind their cause and the North was all unified behind their cause, which was not true in either case. There were dissenters in both uh, regions. Um, this family is from a, the shipbuilding town on the coast of Maine. And they made ships for the coastal trade which was mostly cotton. And so their customers were cotton merchants. And the people in Walterboro thought going to war against their customers was a bad idea. And they 
Although Maine voted for Lincoln in two presidential elections and was abolitionist and uh, pro-war, not Waldeboro. Waldeboro voted against Lincoln both times. And those of us who live through times when there's a controversial war, there's disagreement about whether it should be fought, know that that's a very stressful thing when your neighbor, you have neighbors who don't agree on something where you may have a relative at risk. Um, war does mean hardship, even on the home front. Uh, there's the same amount of work that needs to be done, but a lot of the able-bodied have been siphoned off. And the work tends to fall, the extra work tends to fall on women. Uh, not because they have a lot of extra time, but because they're the ones who are there. Uh, I went, stumbled upon a study that the Irish government did in the 1950s of uh, households that did not have piped in water, which was like two, two thirds or three quarters of the country then. And of course, that was generally the case in the United States in the 1860s. And it found that they spent 30 hours a week hauling water for food, to drink, to wash their clothes, to wash their house, to wash their people. It's a massive uh, expenditure of time. So these were, you, chores were really chores then. Um, also, of course, food and goods become more expensive. We've been through a time of inflation. We know what an immediate bite that takes out of people's lives. Uh, in the Civil War, uh, it was worse in the South than in the North, but it, it hit everybody. And if the war goes on long enough, as it did, hunger begins to stalk the land. Um, but I mentioned that there are opportunities, too. Uh, it was striking to me that during the Civil War, 40,000 women, North and South, uh, went to assist uh, in the care of wounded soldiers. Uh, if you multiply that out as to the people and their families, their daughters, their uh, sisters, their mothers, um, that's a lot of women who saw a different way women could be in the world. Uh, today's term, which I'm not all that comfortable with yet, but they, they had agency. Um, they could change things. They could define what they were going to do. They didn't just have to follow um, social conventions. And I think that was uh, an important thing. And if you look at the women's suffrage movement, um, it really takes off after the Civil War. And I think some of that can be traced to all those women who got up and left home and went hundreds of miles away to, to help people. Uh, now, what about the soldiers? We know that they will be changed by the war. But the most obvious is the cost of battle itself. Um, 700,000 soldiers, that's the current estimate. It's been revised upward a few times in the last 10 or 12 years. But 700,000 uh, roughly died, uh, many by disease, uh, many in combat. Uh, and just to take a make a quick comparison, we had 35 million people and 700,000 died. We now have 360 million people. Comparable losses would be more than 7 million. So imagine in this country, if 7 million soldiers died in a war, the devastation. Uh, you know, I think they're seeing something like that in Eastern Europe now with uh, the Ukraine war. Uh, and it, it leaves a leaves wounds and scars that, that do not heal very fast. Uh, there are some other surprising statistics that I stumbled upon. Um, one was uh, how the war was fought. We, uh, after World War II, 
the Defense Department wanted to find out how many bullets it took to kill an enemy soldier. It's sort of a practical question if you're in charge of the army. And they found that they, their soldiers had, American soldiers had to fire 45,000 bullets to inflict a fatal injury on an enemy soldier. Now, there, there are reasons for that. Uh, one of the things is if you're coming into battle, uh, sometimes you just shoot even though you can't see anything because you're nervous or because you're trying to scare the other guy away. If the other guy runs away, yeah, that's a win. Uh, I've been doing some research on George Patton, and he always told his soldiers, I don't care if you can see the other side, just shoot. Maybe they'll leave. So just, just go after them. Um, but it was also, and I, there's a study, a really interesting one by a fellow named uh, Dave Grossman called On Killing, where he reports about different measures of how hard it is to teach a lot of soldiers to get them to kill. They want to serve their country. Well, most of them do anyway. But there is a reluctance to kill someone, even at a distance, but with a rifle shot. And there are many instances of soldiers who will help their comrades in any way possible. They'll bring them water, they'll bring them ammunition, they'll shoot high, but they really don't want to shoot the other guy. And they've had to change training. Nobody trains now against you know, bullseye targets because it doesn't address this issue. Now they use cutouts of the human form. So you're used to shooting at something that looks like a person. So these were all interesting ways to think about war for me. Um, but I'm talking about the toll on the soldiers themselves. And there's one more statistic. The chances of dying in that war, and you could have done that in your head just in the last few minutes. We had three and a half million served, 700,000 died. That's one in five died. That's pretty terrible odds. Um, and there was, of course, a Defense Department study of what were the odds of an American soldier dying in the Korean War. And they were one in 126. It sounds a lot better. That's still not great. Um, danger is danger. But it puts into context that these guys were scared and, and they were right to be scared. Um, and so let's think about those 80% of the soldiers who came home because some have had some wounds and so they have those scars. But we've known since the epic of Gilgamesh 4,000 years ago and then Homer's Iliad that battle changes people. The experience of, of terror, uh, of extreme risk uh, has a giant effect. Uh, there's a wonderful novelist named Carl Marlantes. You may know his work. He did a novel called Matterhorn about his own experience, inspired by his own experiences in Vietnam, where he was a Marine captain. And he talked in a piece in the Washington Post in the last, uh, I guess it was Memorial Day last year, uh, about how on his first patrol, he went, went into the jungle and he heard a noise. And he thought, is that an animal? Is that a, a, a stick? Is that an enemy? And he said he realized in one terrible moment, he had waited too long. And if it was an enemy, he'd be dead. And he said that changed his mind in a fundamental way. And he has spent 50 years trying to change it back. And he has PTSD now, 50 years later. Now, we do call this post-traumatic stress disorder these days. And we've recognized that it's not just war that causes it. It can be childhood abuse. It can be family abuse. Um, and there are people who think it's being stretched too far. And we're carrying the concept of trauma too far. And that's not my subject today. 
But the question for me to write about this era is did Civil War soldiers have PTSD? And of course they did. Um, there's been a considerable scholarship in the last 25 years about this. It's hard to do because not only was there no such concept, no such word, but the doctors, they, they didn't think it was a thing. I mean, they called men who were reduced to catatonia or were gibberish, gibbering um, at the prospect of battle. They called them malingerers and cowards. That was the Victorian age's attitude. Is they were uh, not real men. Uh, you, if you remember the story in The Red Badge of Courage, Stephen Crane's wonderful novel, um, the protagonist is, is afraid at the beginning of a battle and he, he filters to the back of the uh, formation where he found there's a, there's a bunch of guys back there who were all trying to avoid the battle. Um, in, indeed, in the Civil War, uh, when you get to the third and fourth years, sometimes whole units dropped out. And the officers would be riding around the battlefield desperately looking for somebody who will go forward. Uh, and the soldiers themselves knew that their co comrades sometimes were suffering PTSD-like symptoms. Uh, future Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. served in the Union Army. He was an infantry captain. Uh, he did two stretches. And he was on that terrible campaign uh, Ulysses Grant led in Virginia in 1864. And he wrote home to his mom, many a man has gone crazy since this campaign began from the terrible pressure on mind and body. And the common phrases they used to describe soldiers with these issues were um, broke down, sort of an interesting anticipation of our term breakdown and played out. You see that those term, terms used in, in correspondence. And I want to just emphasize one example because it really jumped out at me. Um, many of you will be familiar with Lieutenant General James Longstreet, uh, who was a Confederate general. He was a West Pointer. Uh, he'd served in the Mexican War, been wounded there. Uh, he was Robert E. Lee's right-hand man in the Army of Northern Virginia. He was on dozens of battlefields in Virginia and Tennessee. Uh, and at the Battle of the Wilderness was a particularly terrible battle. He was shot by one of his own men. Uh, and the bullet came in behind his shoulder and he came out at the base of his throat. It was a terribly uh, bloody wound. And he was taken off the battlefield and he had to be go into uh, recuperation for uh, it was about five months he was out of the war. And it's kind of amazing given the medical care they had that he, he came back. Um, but there was a woman who attended him when he was uh, recuperating. And, you know, General Longstreet was a big deal. Uh, so taking care of General Longstreet was a, was a privilege. And she wrote home to her husband, he is very feeble and nervous. He sheds tears on the slightest provocation and apologize, apologizes for it. He says he does not see why a bullet going through a man's shoulder should make a baby of him. And I, I read it because it captures some of the essential elements of PTSD, which is um, a loss of control over your emotions. You just can't do it. I mean, here's the, the most veteran of veteran soldiers, and he is laid low. And shame, a terrible sense of shame. He had been brave over and over again. But he was ashamed that he, he was crying. Um, Longstreet was merely the most prominent sufferer. There's 
I, I have some other examples. I, I guess I'm going to skip over them. They, they get a little gory. Um, but the symptoms we do know today are exposure to trauma, reliving the event, estrangement from others, uh, poor sleep, poor concentration, exaggerated startle responses. Marlantes wrote about how his, he would terrify his children because if there was a loud noise outside the house, he'd, he'd jump on the floor. He couldn't stop himself. And they had to get used to that. Uh, now, some of those symptoms may sound sort of mild, and in fact, they may, they may describe people we know. But these are extreme versions. And of course, not only the doctors, but family members had no words for describing this. Um, there was just no language, and there was no science of psychiatry. Sigmund Freud was still in elementary school. Uh, but we know now that there is secondhand trauma as well. The family members exposed to this suffering person also experienced trauma. And after the war, these sometimes erratic behaviors they had developed made it hard to get work. They could be disruptive and unreliable. Others were restless and, and took off. They just left. Uh, they traveled around the country. And, I was quite surprised to discover that that's where we get the term hobos, was Civil War veterans um, who traveled the country on the new railroad system that was just opening up after the war. And uh, I thought it was an invention of the Great Depression, but it was for to describe Civil War veterans, and it was a shorthand for homeward bound, uh, it was hobo. Um, there were early stabs at trying to explain what this was. Uh, depression was described as nostalgia, which today's use of the term is, is inappropriate, but it meant a deeply profound sadness. There was a doctor in Philadelphia who described what we now can see are panic attacks. But what he noticed was the physical manifestation, which was these veterans, there are some 300 of them he, he found, would have massively elevated heart rates uh, for up to 15 minutes. And he called them uh, 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 irritable heart syndrome. And so that was a, a medical term for a while. And in World War I, we had this uh, with the term shell shock. World War II, it was called battle fatigue or combat fatigue. Um, and our current treatments now really are not much more than trying to put people in quiet places and help them talk about their experiences and their fears. And there was one last consequence of Civil War service I wanted to chat about for just for a second, which is most of these soldiers, North and South, had left farms, small towns like Walderboro. And... Uh, they were shown the world. They saw, went, traveled through hundreds of miles of country that they never would have seen before. And it changed how they thought of the world. Uh, it became someplace they could go to. Uh, my mother used to use the term from World War I, how are you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? But, that was absolutely an experience after world uh, after the Civil War. And Chicago and St. Louis exploded after the war with veterans who were moving west. A lot continued to move west, west, but a lot stayed in those major hubs. And that's how actually my ancestors landed in Chicago. So how does a historical novelist process all of these? Now, I don't want to give away everything, of course, about the book, but I want to mention a couple of responses. Uh, Henry, the male protagonist, serves in the 20th Maine Infantry Regiment, which was a, one of, I don't know, five or six regiments that are credited with winning the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, they each had their own moments of glory, but the 20th Maine did have a moment of glory. Uh, 
And I made a couple of decisions about him. I wanted to show that not every soldier was disabled by these experiences, by these fears, by these terrors. Different soldiers bring different histories, different predispositions to every war. And then they have different experiences during the war. But the war had to change him. It does. It places tremendous stress on the soldiers, but also on marriages, on parents, on friendships. But again, I didn't want him leveled by it. Have him display some sort of checklist of symptoms. That would be a psychiatry text. And I wanted to show the impact on his family. And he would need to head west after the war, as my ancestor did. And changing the way he lived would not be an escape from what he had experienced. And I've always been moved by the uh, phrase at the end of the Red Badge of Courage after the protagonist has found his courage and he's actually joined the battle. And then they're marching off at the end of the battle. And Crane wrote, so it came to pass as he trudged from the place of blood and wrath, his soul changed. Now, let me just, with your indulgence, read a couple of quick passages from the book. Um, one is the moment, the battle in Gettysburg, of Gettysburg, uh, which uh, the 20th Maine was on the far left uh, flank of the uh, Union defenses. Uh, and they're on Little Round Top. It's a hill. And if the Confederates take it, they'll be able to put artillery there and sweep the Union lines, be a catastrophe. Um, they are attacked by an Alabama regiment. The Alabamians have to go up the hill, so their job is actually harder. And they attack five times. And this is the sixth time. Well, I guess it's the fifth time. The next charge wasn't as bad. They never got closer than 20 yards. When they pulled back, Henry sat on his haunches. He's a sergeant. He thought he'd lost another man on the left. He didn't want to go look. He stood anyway. Hey, Henry. It was Joe. Henry stopped. What's wrong with those boys down there still coming on like that? It ain't natural. You got cartridges? Joe shrugged. Henry paced the line. Six men on his left. None with more than six cartridges. He jogged over to the captain. Clark's face was flushed, smeared with powder and sweat. We're down to throwing rocks, Henry said. Clark grunted. Simons, he called. A man from Bristol stood and turned. Tell the colonel well, we're almost out. Henry paced some more. The men in gray were basking again. They'd taken losses, but they weren't done. Henry felt the rage build. They were going to hold this line. They weren't going back. He scanned his men. Black powder on their faces like war paint. They didn't need to be led, not by the likes of him. The time for tactics was over. This was just going to be pure murder. Bayonet. He, Colonel Chamberlain shouted the word over and over. Captain Clark picked it up. So did Henry. The men fumbled for the wicked-looking blades, jamming them into the sockets. Henry helped a couple of them. The socket on Humphrey's gun was twisted. Henry found another gun for him. The gray coach started back up the hill. They were about halfway, less than 100 yards away. To his left, Henry saw a sword flash. A man in blue, an officer, rose up and shouted. Bayonets glinted in the dappled forest light. Others rose, picking up the shout. Not the rebels' high-pitched screech, but a deep roar, a bellow of rage and bloodlust. The left wing started going downhill. Henry looked at Captain Clark. Clark held a hand to him. Palm, at, palm down. Henry understood. They were the right corner, the anchor for the others to swing around. Company E would charge last. He walked the line. Hang on, boys. We'll be going down. Stand ready. 
the men could see the rebels slow. They were wavering. Henry looked back to the captain. Now, he thought, now, now. Clark swung his sword, and Henry started the shout. The men joined. This was their hill. No slave whippers would take it. So the other passage is after they've moved to Chicago. And so I know there's a Chicago base for your group. So you'll recognize what happens in Chicago in 1871 when they're living there. They have Henry and Katie have two little boys and they're living, uh, I believe it's on Polk Street, uh, which is where my uh, ancestors lived. Uh, and he had a, a butcher store there. Uh, let me get to the right place. They couldn't go as, oh, Katie is ly lying awake and she smells smoke. She jumps to the window and looks out and people are shouting that there's a fire. So they all hurry out of the house with the two little boys. They couldn't go as fast on this street, not through the clogging throng. They passed a man with a parrot on his arm. A woman on Katie's right clutched a cat with terrified eyes. The crowd slowed, piling up in front of a haberdashery where the door was smashed in. Men climbed through the door carrying away shirts and collars. A wagon was stalled in front of them. Henry shouldered his way into the stream of people on the right. Katie and the boys kept it on in his wake. Two well-dressed ladies, jewels sparkling in the firelight, sat in the wagon, which held framed paintings, trunks, furniture. Farther on, the crowd struggled to get around four pianos that sat in the street. In front of each piano, a man stood with folded arms. Henry, Katie shrieked. Thomas's arm had slipped from her. Red fear surged through her. Henry stopped. She passed John to him, nearly hurled the boy through the air. She screamed Thomas's name. A man pushed into her. She pushed back, shoving him to the side. A woman shrank back from her. She screamed Thomas's name again, her arms flailing like a blind woman's, bursting through the arms and legs of these maddening people. It couldn't, he couldn't be far. It had been only two steps, but well, maybe four. She saw a gap in the crowd. She turned sideways, leaned in to push more stupid people away. My boy, she shouted, my boy, Thomas. A man was crouching, holding Thomas's hand. She called his name again and reached for him. Her knee caught the man off balance, knocking him down. She snatched Thomas up. He was crying. She started crying. I'm sorry, she said to him. I'm so sorry. Stay with me. You must. The man, he was still on the ground. She reached a hand to him. I'm sorry, he's my boy. The fleeing people yielded a little space as he rose unsteadily. Thank you, she said. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was easier to return to Henry, moving with the crowd. He had John on the trunk, holding him with both arms. Henry's mouth hung open. His eyes were shadowed in the stuttering light. Black soot covered his face. She nodded. He nodded back. You must walk again, she said into Thomas's ear as she crouched to set him down. You're the, you're the bravest boy in this whole city, but Mama needs you to walk. Yes, Mama, she said. Grab my skirt and don't ever let go, no matter what happens. She set him down and reached for John. Henry started. Explosions came from behind. Katie turned her head to look. A rocket of flame soared up. It was close. The fire, voracious, all-powerful, was sprinting to them, gorging on the brittle wood <laughs> of homes and abandoned possessions, racing to consume stables and sheds and plank sidewalks fed by highways of fire fuel. Another, <clears throat> another explosion boomed, louder but farther away. Barrels of kerosene or oil, she thought. Maybe paint, Maybe grain elevators, they sometimes had explosions, even without fires like this. Another terrible noise, a crumbling, screaming crash. The building collapsed, walls tum tumbling and cries of surprise. Animals screamed. John burrowed his head into her neck. Her arm ached. She wanted to switch the 
the arm that held John but couldn't risk losing another boy. She held Thomas tight. They shuffled on. So, um, I've been trying to look at uh, what's in on the chat here, and I don't see anything I can talk about. I don't know Ernest Dollar's book, but I would certainly welcome any comments or questions pe people would have. Well, I, I was the one who posted about the Ernest Dollar book, and he has a great treatment of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and the various names for it. Um, focusing on just the end of the Civil War, and specifically North Carolina. So if anybody's interested in the topic, uh, it really is a good treatment. I, I read several, but I, I did not come up on that one. It's a real, relatively new book. It just came out a couple months ago. Oh, well, that, okay. I'm in the clear. I wonder if instead of attempting to write in the chat, I can ask you or oh, tell you some, something that I realized uh, in listening to you. Uh, my uh, great grandmother came from Scotland uh, around uh, 1870 and married my great grandfather who was at Fort Hamilton um, toward the end of the Civil War. I don't know if he ever uh, suffered any uh, battles, but um, he ended up being a very severe alcoholic. And I, I never connected it before with what have, might have happened to him during the war. So thank you. Yeah, that's certainly one of the outcomes that, that happened. David, I think you very successfully conveyed the uh, tension, the uh, agony of your characters. I, I was very impressed with the tone. Thank you. It was uh, it was a hard time. And, you know, it, well, I find it hard to read about the, the fighting in Ukraine now because those people are going through very similar stuff. I mean, even scarier because there's eyes in the sky shooting at them. Yes. David, can I ask a, a quick question just in, re in regards to the Ukraine um, situation today? Does it seem wars of the era of the Civil War um, and really up through World War II to some degree, well, no, World War I more than World War II. It seems in, in the last hundred years, we'll say, that civilian populations have been much more um, affected by these wars than they were in the Civil War. I just wonder yeah. what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, you're right. And it, it's all technology. Uh, and it has changed morals. Uh, you know, in 1870, uh, if you had said that it was okay, if you had said to a bunch of soldiers, uh, generals, it's okay to uh, shoot cannons at civilian areas, they would have locked you up. I mean, it, it wasn't okay. It wasn't done. And their weapons weren't very good at doing it. But the weapons just kept getting better and better. First, it was the artillery. Then we developed tanks. And the big breakthrough I've been reading on this was uh, airplanes. Um, you could just bomb people from the sky. And that was a huge transformation. Um, not so much World War I, but World War II. And, you know, uh, I just did a program with a fellow who's done a book on the atom bomb. And, you know, they didn't consider dropping the atom bomb on Tokyo because it had all been burned up. We had firebombed it so often that there wasn't much left to destroy. Uh, so we got through this uh, reluctance to punish the women and children and old people. And now it's, it's accepted. I mean, it, it, World War II, both sides, I mean, we're no better on this count than anybody else. And, you know, we all justify it because the other guy does it. 
And if we don't do it, the other guy will do it. I just recently read a prime minister of England, uh, Stanley Baldwin, in the 1930s, in a very emotional speech to Parliament said, you know, what war is today is killing women and children. And if you don't, the only way to protect your own women and children is to kill the other guy's women and children first. Um, and that's a terrible thing that we have come to. I mean, killing men is not great, but, you know, generally they have weapons. And you know, we're more conditioned to it. But, you know, now it, it's one society against the other society. It is truly a horror. Uh, we can see it in uh, Gaza. We can see it in Ukraine. David, I think you're right about World War II being the, uh, the war that uh, combined uh, uh, improvements. And I use that term advisedly uh, in technology with uh, 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 radical ideology, difference, ideological differences. And of course, in the, the war in the Pacific, also racism was was a part of the uh, the uh, animosity. Uh, you know, it started war in Europe with the uh, the the Blitz in London and the the, the uh, deaths among the civilian population. And of course, that eventually led to the firebombing of Dresden and then what you just mentioned about the, the war in the Pacific, which is, you know, the war in the Pacific was, uh, uh, you know made the war in Europe look almost chival chivalrous by, by comparison. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disease that is rampant now. Uh, we're, we're seeing it in Ukraine, we're seeing it in, uh, in uh, Israel and Gaza. It's, I don't uh, know how we deal I, with it. I, I'm studying now uh, these two 20th century figures, one is George Patton, who was an extremely effective general. And the other is a British man who believed in fighting World War II, but he also crusaded his whole life for disarmament. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and they it's an accident of history. They both were athletes at the Stockholm Olympics of 1912. Um, and just trying to compare you know, the man who mastered war and wanted to fight it, and he did want to fight it, and the man who studied war his whole life to try to figure out how to stop it. And uh, I, I, uh, it, it's, it's not an encouraging experience. Uh, we're, we're, we're violent people. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm afraid I'm not sending you off singing songs. It's... <laughs> You're speaking truth. Well. I, I find it interesting that the, the concept of uh, a just war and uh, we, we think, in, re in retrospect, we think that uh, World War II was a just war, but um, there's a difference between the justice of making war and the manner in which it is, uh, it is uh, prosecuted. And uh, uh, I don't think there's any, any just prosecution of a war. It is like uh, the 20th Maine. It's uh, to survive, you, uh, you've got to uh, immerse yourself in it. You've got to submer submerge yourself in it. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think, uh, and I don't think it, no one is unscathed that, 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 that uh, comes out of that. <clears throat> yeah, one of the interesting things, uh, I've been th thinking about is of the 20th century statesmen who dealt with disarmament issues, um, two who were very 
eager for disarmament. Uh, were Dwight Eisenhower, who of course led the war effort and really they continued disarmament negotiations all through his presidency. And we don't do, even consider it now. Um, and Khrushchev, who was the premier of the Soviet Union, where of course the war was more terrible than anywhere else except Germany. And uh, I do think the people who know war probably hate it the most, except for maybe George Patton. Yeah. Some years ago, I was uh, mayor of a town in New Jersey, and, and as a part of that uh, effort, part of the, my time as mayor, I got to be good friends with three uh, veterans of D-Day, all of whom came in. Uh, one was a paratrooper, came in with the 101st <clears throat> Airborne. The other two, one came in on Omaha and one, the other one on Utah. And the paratrooper uh, was an interesting guy, a small, small guy. Um, but he, he, uh, his daughter, I, I found in, in talking to these men that they, it took a long while for them to uh, open up. Uh, and I could see, uh, the, the pain they, they, they didn't want to talk about what they had seen. And they certainly did not want to talk about what they had to do. But this one fellow, the paratrooper, his, his daughter told me a story, um, they, it was in France, and I think they had just taken the town of Carantan, the 101st. And uh, uh, Charlie captured a German officer, and he had an iron cross around his neck. And Charlie wanted that iron cross. So he grabbed the, the cross and yanked it off of the officer's neck, and the officer spit in his face. And his daughter told me that Charlie <coughs> took his M1 and smashed his face killed him. And uh, Charlie would not tell me that, but his daughter did. And it sort of really, it just, I think it uh, demonstrates in a very uh, harsh way, very brutal way, the, uh, the impact that uh, combat has on a, an otherwise average person. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a Terrible story, and there, uh, Batman was always dealing with this. He was accused of trying to, of telling his troops to kill prisoners, and he was always saying, "I never say that." And, but when you turn your, when you surrender, and certainly with the Japanese, this was true. Um, that was no guarantee you were going to survive. Talking about Civil War stories, <clears throat> I had three great grandfathers in the Confederate Army, three very different experiences. One, Duncan Cole, had a furlough and ran away and never came back. He hid out in a barnyard, uh, was fed with the pigs and the cows, and uh, totally disappeared. Uh, my great grandfather, William Henry Roberts, took great pride. The year he died in 1923, he took the train from North Carolina to New Orleans for the big Confederate reunion. It was camaraderie. He took great pride in those friendships. And he was a musician. I have his euphonium right now in my living room. And uh, my great-grandfather -grand McLeod was wounded at Fort Stedman, put in a military hospital. Lincoln toured and spoke to him. He w managed to walk home after uh, uh, after the war. When, as he approached the home, he was emaciated, raggedly, ragged, ragged clothing, had a long beard, and was could hardly walk. The children hid under the house; they were so afraid. Mm -hmm. The children were totally afraid of him. Three different experiences. Yeah.
Well, you have certainly moved us all today, David. I This has been a very profound discussion. I just uh, would invite any other comments or discussion with David th this morning. I'm anxious to see how that story turns out. I'm going to be hopping on to Amazon just as soon as we finish up, up here. What a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy and uh, Judy Kerr, are you, I I'm wondering, are you trying to get your microphone on? It looks as if you're trying to say something. Judy, I couldn't see you earlier, but welcome, Judy. What you got, San Sandy? We can't, uh, oh no. I think I've got it now. Uh, I'd be interested in your commentary on the, and you made, but in part on the impact on society by the fact that so many people serve. And of course we don't have that today. Uh, I, I think we have better decision-making when we have our more of our representatives having had the experience but uh, during Vietnam, we had people who came in, I was in the Navy, came into the Navy and got PTSD without ever setting foot in Vietnam, just because the environment was so different and alien to a farm boy from Oklahoma. And, uh, uh, and we ended up by getting him discharged to go back to the farm uh, with a general under honorable, so he'd have benefits and and not be dishonorable. He wasn't afraid to work, but he could never fit in and operate effectively in the environment. Uh, and uh, in World War II, I had an uncle who was survived the Malmody massacre barely. He was given three days R and R and put back on the line, and then he went on to liberate Dachau. And you talk about PTSD. Uh, when, it, when it would hit him, he'd get in a car with a tape of bagpipes, particularly Amazing Grace, and he would ride up and down the Atlantic Ocean, drop away, and it could be an hour, it could be a day, it could be multiple days, and when he was recomposed, he'd come back and go back to work. But tough the, stories. But the real question is, do you, with the research you've done, uh, what, do you think we ought to have what Eisenhower wanted, which was public service to for everyone? Well, you know, uh, I was in the Vietnam generation and I got a high lottery number and I, I was glad. Uh, and uh, it and I've always felt a little bad about it. Um, but I think it changes us not to have a draft. I can see this in younger people. Um, the military, except for traditionally mil military families, I'm not saying anything novel. A lot of people have noticed that the same family seemed to produce most of our soldiers. Um, don't view foreign engagements or that sort of issue as anything that has anything to do with them. And that changes how we act. I think we have a lot fewer uh, uh, veterans who are in public service. Uh, and I think that's, there's just fewer veterans. But also, I think we maybe honor it a bit less, and I think that's all unfortunate. I mean, it is the ultimate thing the state does, and people with experience of it have a lot to offer in those discussions and, con and you know, considerations. And, um, and, and I, I agree with you completely that some service to the community, to the culture, to the society, to the country, uh, is absolutely fair to ask. Uh, this some, last summer I was in uh, Finland and uh, every, I mean, they've been afraid of the Russians for 500 years. 
and everybody in Finland does military service. There's no way out. And there's no community service. It's military. And uh, it, it is a unifying thing. I mean, I had it in a small way when I went to college where you get people from all worlds, from all parts of the country and throw them together. Um, you, you create a better country. I was just thinking of that. One of the uh, one of the benefits of universal service is that it takes us out of our self segregated society. You know, we live in this. You know, we 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 have this sense of interconnectedness in our society, but th that's on a, just on a superficial level. And uh, but when you're in basic training and you're living with uh, uh, a kid from Harlem or a kid from uh, from uh, you know the hollers of West Virginia and uh, a couple of Puerto Rican kids, um, it, it has a you know you 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 start to look at them as uh, as human beings as as fellow human beings and you uh, get a gain a greater appreciation that I think carries over in, uh, into civilian life. We don't have that. Now and that's a shame. I'm a member of uh, the veterans group here in Illinois, and we had an army recruiter come and talk to us a few months ago. They're having a lot of trouble getting recruits. Part of the problem is they can't pass the written test. The other part is they can't pass the physical test, and. Um, it's a, it's a real shame to see that uh, young people can't pass some of these things. The written test, he was saying, is so basic. If you can read, you can pass the test. But these are, these are people that are out of high school and they can't read. And it's only getting worse with you know the pandemic and everything else that's going on. Um, they said they've had a lot of uh, aliens that wanted to recruit, wanted to go in the service, but they have to have a green card. So um, they're really having trouble. And it's not just the Army, it's all of them, all of the uh, services. I don't know if anybody's ever done a study of it, but the Civilian Conservation Corps before World War II uh, sort of prepared an awful lot of unemployed males to be able to function when the draft came. Actually, a friend of mine did a book about the army before World War II. It's called uh, uh, The Rise of the GI Army. Um, and it just covers that time. And he makes that point at some length that the CCC, which is actually commanded by a lot of former army people, um, was a uh, the, the people in the CCC had that experience of being, you know, part of a unit and having to, co you know, coordinate and cooperate. And they were a recruiting uh, target that that experience was. And the other, other irony is for World War II, I think we, we had to reject like a third of the people who wanted to go in the army be, or were drafted because they were too skinny. They were malnourished. It was depression times. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of them get, a lot of people who want to get in the service get uh, uh, disqualified because they're too fat. And it just sort of shows you, uh, I guess, not a great trend line. <laughs> I always give thanks to the uh, CCC and the WPA every time I, I drive on the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway. You know, yeah. what they, we, we still benefit from, from their contribution in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, you've given us a lot to think about uh, and a bit sobering, but very, very interesting and helpful. And I, <clears throat> I doff my tam to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate you, you all coming and hear me out. 
Thank you, David. Oh, well said, Sandy. Don, were you about to comment? No, I'm, th I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, My David. Pleasure. Well, I think we'll go ahead and conclude today uh, and, and go and ha have our private thoughts and um, memorials. David, thank you. And God bless all of you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, David. Thanks, David.